I'm Representative Rob Bryan, and uh, I'm chairing our committee. Glad to see uh, many of you. I know we're maybe seeing each other a little sooner than we'd like to, but, but I'm but I'm I'm glad uh, glad to see you, and um, uh, just glad to um, get to further this conversation. Um, I want to make just a couple of opening remarks. Um, you should all have an agenda in front of you, and. Uh, Sort of run through the way the meeting uh, today is going to go. Um, I'm going to make a couple of remarks. We're going to go through some. Uh, Kara McCraw will go through some legislative history. Uh, we've got Nancy Barber, uh, who's been working with DPI here, and she's going to present um, some of the turnaround strategies that have been in place in the state uh, previously and presently. And then we'll talk through some of the actual bill particulars. Um, not not for I'm really just going to sort of try to walk you through where the bill is and give you some time I know um, it, when we get to be off session for a while uh, you may not have full time to uh, read through and go through all these things so this is not going to be a, this will be a chance just to sort of walk through things in a way where we can you know we've got staff here and we'll, we'll have an opportunity to uh, uh, give you guys some time to think and, and um, you know, we'll have some follow-up from there. Um, let me also uh, just thank our uh, our sergeant at arms here with us today, uh, Reggie Sills, Marvin Lee, and uh, Terry McGraw. Y'all, thank you guys as always for serving. I think they had a a, a nice mess in this room when we came in this morning, so I appreciate them uh, making this uh, putting it in good shape for us all to be here. Um, j just as just as an introductory comment. Um, some folks asked me how I got interested in achievement school districts generally, and uh, I wanted to give you just a little of my my history of, of, of my interest. And as, as many of you know, I did a program called Teach for America, taught in a bilingual classroom in uh, inner city Los Angeles a very long time ago. Now it doesn't doesn't seem like it um, some days, but the kids I taught are now out of college I think so I know that that means it's been a while because I taught them in second and third grade and uh, I, I get their magazine from Teach for America every month and I happen to see on the cover of one of them it had this this achievement school district in Memphis and my mom is actually from Memphis and so I used to go there a lot as a kid growing up and she was actually a public school teacher for a pretty long time and, and in fact her best friend was still teaching in the public schools in Memphis and so that drew my attention to it when I saw this magazine article about them and what was going on. And uh, so that's part of what created you know, an interest for me in seeing what was going on in other states. I also have a good friend of mine that uh, has run some schools in New Orleans. Obviously, New Orleans had a massive uh, shift in their schools back after Hurricane Katrina. Um, and, uh, you know, fundamentally revamped um, their school district and one of the things I want to clarify when we have this conversation is we are neither Tennessee nor are we Louisiana nor New Orleans um, what I'm looking to do here in pilot fashion is look at what opportunities would best work for North Carolina and we need to craft our own legislation that works um, for the students here um, so I think with that background I wanted to um, let uh, Kara give you guys some of the history on you know what's what's happened legislatively here in North Carolina some, some of it um, uh, may actually be news to you that, it, that that we have some statutes statutes in place um, but with that let me uh, let Kara give you some background um, thank you Chairman Bryan and committee. Um, so the chair did ask that we briefly review what is currently in the statutes in terms of reform models for continually low performing schools. So there is a statute um, that is actually GS 115C 105.37B. It's a statute we'll be discussing. It is entitled um, Reform of Continually Low Performing Schools. Can you speak loud, please? Yes, let me get a little closer to the mic. So this statute is relatively new. It was enacted in 2010. 
and what it allows is for local boards of education to adopt one of four models for a continually low performing school in their district. It does require that the State Board of Education approve their request to adopt one of these models. So in order to have context, we have to understand what is a continually low performing school. We have to look at two other statutes for that definition. So 115C-105.37A defines continually low performing schools. It's a school that meets two criteria. They've received state mandated assistance and they have been designated by the state board as low performing for two or three consecutive years. In order to understand that, we have to understand what is a low performing school. That's defined in 115C-105.37. This is a new change that was done in 2015, this definition of low performing. And it is a school that has received a school performance grade of D or F and a school growth score of met expected growth or not met expected growth as defined under and the st statute of references is the school report card statute. Um, so if you are a low performing school under that definition for two or three consecutive years and you've received state mandated assistance, then you're designated as a continually low performing school. Can I um, yes, sir. What was Representative Horn. Was any of that, either of those definitions impacted at all by the uh, action in the last session, the long session of general assembly? Yes, sir. The definition of low performing schools was changed. And the definition previously for low performing schools was schools where there is a failure to meet the minimum growth standard as defined by the state board and a majority of students are performing below grade level. So prior to the 15-16 school year, that was the definition of a low performing school. Beginning with the 15-16 school year, we are moving to this new definition tied to the school report cards. Uh, I'm sorry, <coughs> Representative Black. Uh, since it looks like from your handout that uh, you're moving into the transformation of the models next, explain to me what is state mandated assistance, which is the other requirement, mandated by whom? So, the statutes that the, the article that these statutes are located in are all dealing with low performing schools and there are specific requirements in those statutes for schools that are continually low performing that assistance teams be provided by the state to assist those school systems in working with those schools well, what i uh, <coughs> follow up now. what i'm trying to understand is what the state mandated assistance as a requirement add that's not included already in the definition of low performing school? Can you be low performing school but not receive mandated assistance so therefore you don't fall under this? And if so, how, what's the distinction? How does that happen? So it is possible for a school to become low performing for just one year. So their test scores and such would be they take a dip they're a low performing school, but they're not yet continually low performing because they haven't met that two out of three year requirement and they may not have triggered the need for the state to intervene yet. So if they have triggered the need for the state to intervene because they have a pattern and they've received the assistance and have continued to be low performing for two out of three years, then they get this designation of continually low performing school. Follow up. Right. I, 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 I hope I'm not being dense. We've got the definition of low performing, and you've got to be two out of three years. That's a, like a separate requirement. Do you have mandated assistance for schools that don't meet the low performing two out of three years, uh, or is there some other factor that could take a low performing school? two out of three years but they don't get mandated assistance and therefore they're not included. I, I'm still not real clear on what state mandated assistance adds or eliminates to your getting into the situation where you're a candidate for this reform. And I'll be I will be happy to get you the copy of the statute that spells all the, out all the factors. I believe what the statutes are trying to do if you work your way through them progressively is the first low performing school designation is the trigger of 
you've got some trouble. And then we're going to attempt to assist you. That's the state mandated assistance. And then we've attempted to assist you and you continue to be in trouble. Now you're continually low performing, which triggers a new set of uh, requirements under the statute of what we're supposed to help you with. So it's sort of a progressive as you continue to not do well, even though we've offered assistance, you may get into this category. Yes. So the, one of the current statutes right now actually allows the state board to assign an assistance team to any school identified as low performing as Kara has been describing or to any other school that requests an assistance team. So it's sort of this tiered model of trying to assist the, the folks that need it the most first that have been sort of continually low performing for a while and then, you know, then as their resources are allowed, work their way down. So it's a, you know, it's a multi-step process. Some of those things are not being done because of resource issues. The department can certainly speak to that um, more than we can, but uh, I think it's safe to say that all the low performing school statutes, the assistance team statutes, probably are not being implemented to a T the way the statute is, statutes describe because these are close to 15 years old, some of these statutes, and we've come and gone through a number of uh, various initiatives during that. Let me make, maybe I'll just make one comment, Representative Blackwell, because uh, I think I, I think part of your question is just getting into this definition. It's, it's sort of in, in the intricacy of this definition and trying to figure out what, what, whether the word continually being added, what exactly that does versus state mandated assistance, and, and whether or not all these things sort of coherently fit together. And I think that might be. Um, something we can do a little more diligence on after the fact to make sure we're clear on. Yeah. I, I guess where I'm, what I'm trying to get at, and maybe in the final analysis it doesn't matter, but if you meet the definition of low performing two out of three years, do we even need the reference to mandated assistance in there as though it's a separate distinct requirement if it's actually included in some manner uh, theoretically in, in the other standard. And I, I'm just trying to add, uh, understand if we've got two things to me, or if every school that receives mandated assistance will necessarily fall into the category of one that has been low performing under this definition for two out of the last three years. And, and I'm, I'm not sure actually that they will always, I think there are some exceptions to that, um, but I will say the next presentation, Dr. Barber is going to talk about the district and school transformation, and she may be able to shed some more light on how they focus their efforts currently. Um, so we do have that definitional change, so for the next three years there is going to be a transition period where for the definition of continually low performing we will be using the old definition that was in place prior to 15-16 for part of that analysis as well as the new definition going forward. Um, the Department of Public Instruction has told me that they estimate they are finishing their analysis for this current school year that there are approximately 132 continually low performing schools in North Carolina. So there are four models that are provided in the statute, and I'm going to briefly review those for you. The first is the transformation model. The transformation model has four key components that are supposed to be included in that model if it's adopted for the school. Um, one of the focuses is, is on teacher and school leader effectiveness. The next is on uh, reform of the instructional strategies. The next is on learning time and creation of community-oriented schools, and then finally, operational flexibility and sustained support. The next model is the restart model. That allows the school to be operated with the same flexibility and exemptions from statute as a charter school or under the management of an outside entity an educational management organization that the school system has selected through a rigorous review process. There are two caveats that are listed in that section. One is that the school does remain under the control of the local board of education. And secondly, there is a carve out from that exemption charter-like flexibility, and that is that the employment statutes do still apply in those schools for teachers. The next model is the turnaround model. 
this deals a lot with the staffing at the school and it does require the replacement of the principal if the principal had been at that school for at least three years it requires that 50 percent of the staff at least be changed out so you can rehire no more than 50 percent it doesn't require them to adopt a governance structure consistent with the school-based management and accountability program and that they implement an instructional program aligned with the standard course of study which are required for all schools and then the last model is the school closure model it simply allows the school to be closed um, the school closure does have to be consistent with the other statutes related to school closure which do require the school system to do a study and on the feasibility of closing the school as well as have a public hearing but it has one additional requirement that normally you would have for the school closure and that's that the students who went to that school have to be enrolled in other higher achieving schools within the district once the school is closed the statute requires the state board to adopt rules to develop requirements for these models because these are relatively compact in the statutes to flesh out the additional requirements and then if any school system adopts one of these models there's annual reporting if needed to date no school system has asked the state board to adopt one of these models there are schools in the state that have done similar variations of these models under race to the top because these models were the same models that the feds had suggested under race to the top but no school system has come to the state board and asked under the statute to adopt a model and then finally um, the chair asked if we could very briefly just talk about turnaround districts in other states um, there are uh, it's been a number of discussion about turnaround districts in other states and consideration of legislation so i'm focusing on the three districts that currently have operating turnaround districts not that are in the process of development there are three uh, the oldest is in louisiana it's the louisiana recovery school district it was first created in 2003 it was uh, quite it was quite a large expansion of it in 2005 post katrina um, the majority of the schools in that district are in New Orleans. There are 75 schools total in it. There are a few in Baton Rouge as well. The Tennessee Achievement School District and the Mis Michigan Education Achievement Authority were both created in 2012, and both of them were developed as part of Race to the Top applications for those states. Tennessee received one of the Race to the Top um, grants and used it for creation of this district. They have 29 schools. Most of them are in Memphis. I believe there's one in Nashville. And the Michigan um, grant application, they did not receive the grant, but they decided to go forward with their own funding for it. Um, and they have 15 schools in Detroit that are currently within that authority. And I'm ready for any questions.